Yesterday, Hampton University released a statement on the Ukraine war in regards to refugee students titled Hampton University to offer free room, board, and tuition to Ukraine and international students studying in Ukraine displaced by ongoing conflict. Now, I've seen a lot of people reacting to this online. There's a lot of us saying, oh, I can't believe that they're allowing them to have free room, board, and tuition, but they're not offering that for black students. So I just wanted to take a moment to bring a little clarity to what's going on here. But first, let's read the statement to see what exactly Hampton University will be doing for Ukrainian and international students. In a humanitarian effort to help those college students and families affected by the current conflict in Ukraine, Hampton University President Dr. William R. Harvey has announced that it will invite 50 to 100 Ukrainian and international college students presently studying in Ukraine to continue their education on HU's campus this summer. The collective Hampton University facility, staff, and students are heartbroken because the war-torn country of Ukraine must deal with atrocities like the bomb bombing of maternity wards, hospitals, and other civilian areas, said Hampton University President Dr. William R. Harvey. I think this partnership is something that can be beneficial to a great number of students and families. My entire career has been focused on helping people to achieve and meet their goals. Ukrainian and international college students affected by the combat will be able to attend classes at Hampton for the 2022 summer session, receive room, board and tuition for the summer and have the option to stay at Hampton at the regular tuition and fees rates once the summer session is over. Do you see Hispanic serving institutions putting out statements like this? No. Do you see Asian American and Pacific Islander serving institutions putting out statements like this? No. But of course it would be an HBCU. You see, this is Hampton University's way of signaling to the Biden administration, as well as the Democratic Party at large, that they are on board with whatever their political talking points are, whether it be about the war in Ukraine or the Big 19, it doesn't matter. We're here for the Democratic Party, so please send us some more money. And this is exactly why the Biden administration and the Democratic Party at large consistently disrespects HBCUs the way that they do. I just covered in my last video Video, how the Biden administration gave HBCUs the least amount of funding out of all minority serving institutions. And back in October of last year, I covered how in Biden's Build Back Better Act, HBCUs are slated to get the least amount of funding as well. They will have to compete for the money. And not only that, but they'll only be competing for pennies on the dollar. There were even members of Congress that took a step back and said, hold up, now wait a minute. This is some bull. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to play that segment of the video for you right now. And to do that, we're going to read from this article here from Inside Higher Ed. And this article is titled, Biden's Promise to HBCUs Unfulfilled by Congress. President Biden's ambitious higher education agenda has had its disappointments as Congress turns it into legislation with a strict budget forcing lower than anticipated funding levels for some of its provisions. While the bill includes funding for historically black colleges and universities, advocates say it is well below what's needed. In the current version of the Budget Reconciliation Bill, serving as the vehicle for Biden's Build Back Better Act, HBCUs and minority-serving institutions are slated to receive $27 billion in tuition subsidies, $1.45 billion for institutional aid, and $2 billion to improve research and development infrastructure. Meanwhile, Biden proposed a total of $55 billion for HBCUs and other MSIs to upgrade research infrastructure and create research incubators to improving STEM education. The number is just significantly lower than what we had hoped for said Paul Jones, president of Fort Valley State University and vice chair of the Council of 1890 Presidents. Along with the minority serving institutions and the Hispanic serving institutions, is really sort of lumping us all into this one sector when we all have tremendous needs. The biggest champion of the legislation, Representative Alma Adams, and Democrat from North Carolina, sent a letter to her colleague Sunday expressing concerns with how the infrastructure funding has been structured in the Build Back Better Act. Now, what I have here highlighted in blue is very important. First, that all the MSIs will have to compete 
for the same pot of money. And second, the priority is given to institutions receiving less than $10 million a year in federal research dollars. This is contrary to President Biden's own goals for HBCUs and MSI funding, which states to ensure funding is more equitably distributed among HBCUs, TCUs, and MSIs. The Biden administration will require that competitive grant programs make similar universities compete against each other. For example, ensuring that HBCUs only compete against HBCUs. If this language as written becomes law, it is accurate to say that HBCUs will only successfully compete for pennies on the dollar. Adams wrote, adding that while she appreciates the intention of allowing colleges and universities with smaller research capacities to jumpstart their efforts, the legislation would actually inhibit R2 HBCUs from becoming R1 institutions by deprioritizing their grant applications. So all of you who are out here stomping the yard for Joe and Kamala went from $60 billion to being deprioritized to only compete for pennies on the dollar. Now in closing, what I really want you to pay attention to is the strategic discrimination that's happening to you. Pay attention to how the Democrats have cleverly crafted this bill to be utterly useless to HBCUs. You see, Technically, you're included in this bill, and technically, you can apply for this money. But based on the way the law was written, you've been deprioritized. Meaning, you can apply if you want to, but you won't be getting much back, even if your application is accepted. The only thing Biden has done since he's gotten into office is spit in the face of HBCUs. But what people don't understand is that these HBCUs actually have power. There's only 102 HBCUs in the country. So can you imagine if the presidents of these HBCUs actually got together and stood up for themselves by telling the government, you're not going to take advantage of us anymore and use us as your political pawns to gain black votes. And if you want our cosign, you're going to have to start passing meaningful, substantive legislation that exclusively addresses the specific needs of the black community the same way you do for everybody else. And if you don't, not only will we not co-sign you, but we will also use our institutions to counter whatever BS narrative that you're trying to push. Do you know how powerful that would be? They have the power, they simply choose not to exercise it. They're choosing to be weak because they don't actually believe that they can stand up on their own. This is why you see Hampton University pandering to the Biden administration looking for a pat on the head for co-signing the U.S.'s involvement in the Ukraine war by bringing in these students. But as I stated earlier, it's funny how you don't see the Hispanic serving institutions and the AAPI serving institutions doing the same thing. They're not following suit because they're not looking for a pat on the head. But the president of Hampton University clearly is. But let's go back to the fact that they have power but choose not to use it because they don't believe that they can stand up on their own. And the reason that I want to go back to that is because if we're being honest, this is a problem with a good deal of the black community as a whole. Many of us don't actually believe that we can stand up on our own. Now there are many areas of weakness within the black community, more than what we'd like to admit, but we do have areas of strength. And this is one of them. So then the question becomes, will HBCUs continue to choose to be weak? Or will they for once stand up on their own strength and leverage their power and influence on behalf of the black community that they're supposed to be representing? Only time will tell. And with all that being said, that does it for today's video. So please make sure you hit that subscribe button as well as the bell notification next to the subscribe button so you can be notified whenever I release a new video. All social